Today's video is brought to you by Raycon, the beautiful earbuds stuck in my ear that drown out my terrible neighbor from yelling at me every day. Ladies and gentlemen, I love to do blockchain analysis. If you've been following me lately when I've been covering these recent videos regarding weird shady things in the cryptocurrency world, I sit down and I browse like hundreds of thousands of transactions. No, I wish I could tell you that I was exaggerating. So I use Raycons just so I can put on some good old fashioned lo-fi tunes to drown out everything around me and keep me in an absolute zen-like state. Raycons also come with a bunch of gel tips as well too, so they really do stick in your ear unlike some other brands, where uh, again, it helps to constantly drown out the nature around me. It also has a 32 hour battery life, so you know, there's less time spending in the case and more time sitting editing without any fear of disconnections. They start at half the price of other premium audio brands, and I'm not an audiophile, but they sound just as good to me. And Raycons come with a 45 day happiness guarantee. So if you don't really like it, well, you can go and return it. So if you want to go give Raycon some chance, you can go to buyraycon.com slash someordinarygamer and get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and cyber warfare is today's topic, and I wanted to sit down and take a look at one group together with you, one called Lazarus. Now North Korea is an interesting topic for me. If you followed my channel at all, you know that I made numerous videos covering propaganda channels, video games even, and even looking at one of their operating systems known as Red Star OS. It's fascinating to hear even the tiniest tidbits to come out of a country so isolated. There's so much footage that you can watch that leaks out of North Korea, whether it's disseminated through a propaganda TikTok account, which exists, a few YouTubers allowed to publish from there, some of them even removed by YouTube, or the occasional documentary, you actually tend to develop a picture about it. What I'm most interested in is, is the growth of technology in North Korea. Throwing away whatever beliefs or reservations you have, North Korea is actually advanced, relatively. They've got internet since, you know, the early 2000s. They've got access to an internet which only a handful of people can use. Kyung if you don't know what an intranet is, it's basically an internal network that's running entirely within North Korea. Think of it kind of like the deep web, how we use the Tor system. The Tor, in a way, is an intranet that we all connect to through a browser and we browse various onion sites routed within it. Now to understand, this intranet they have is also heavily monitored, full of propaganda, and they've had their first email service in 2001 from a local bank called Sealy. Now that's also probably monitor too, but hey, they even had chat rooms all the way back then where they discussed basketball and various sports. Hey, worldwide pandemic, social distancing, Zoom, I mean, that's what the rest of the world uses, but North Korea, they're all just built differently. They use something called Rakwan, which is their own version of teleconferencing. Smartphones, hoo <laughs> get out of here. What, you using Samsung, you using iPhones, you using a little bit of that HTC, get out of here. The real brand is Ararong, which is actually their premier brand. Uh, the flagship stats are actually pretty interesting, I'm not gonna lie, it's got four gigs of memory, a 13 megapixel rear camera, no Facebook, wait. That's actually a pretty good thing, dude, that's actually pretty based. All right, whatever. Clearly North Korea isn't in the fucking Stone Age, which some people actually think they are, okay? Maybe they're a little bit, you know, turn of the century Cold War, but they're getting better. They're getting there. They've got a ways to go. But given the economic sanctions that North Korea faces and the relative poverty of the nation, uh, this is probably the best you're going to get for now. Now, there's a movie that I was watching a couple weeks ago called Blackout. I'm really into found footage movies. It's not that great of a film, but it actually details the loss of the power grid in the United Kingdom. So for the first few days in this movie, everything goes relatively fine. I mean, it's a loss of power. But as time presses on and forward, they actually start rationing out resources. And so once they start spreading super thin, the society eventually starts to crumble. People turn on one another and things start going to shit. Now, again, if you think about it, we just had the colonial pipelines hack. Now again, the parallel can be brought up, right? The moment that hack was brought into the forefront, there were law enforcement agencies that jumped to quickly fix up as much as they actually could. Now at the end of the day, things got basically fixed up. But in the current world of cyber warfare, there, you gotta understand there's three key big players. The United States, the Russian Federation, and China. These three countries alone are some of the biggest superpowers in the entire planet. But beyond these three big countries are smaller but sizable players as well. This includes India, 
India, the United Kingdom, Iran, Israel, which basically is just the United States by proxy. And then you have North Korea, which again is just China by proxy. So again, going forward, North Korea is important in this case because it's a good understanding of how somebody can grow so fast within the cyber warfare industry. See, with conventional warfare, it's expensive. And in many cases, you actually end up completely losing your initial investment. For instance, the United States just pulled out of Afghanistan with over a trillion dollars down the hole in the span of a few days, even a week, it all basically unraveled. I mean, the, the, the entire thing just completely crashed the bed. Of course, that's not the same with the various defense contractors in the United States whose stock prices basically skyrocketed to the moon. But hey, that's, I mean, that's a different video. And the closest you'll get right now to me even commenting on that is my Metal Gear Solid 4 video. For now. WMDs are incredibly regulated, and unless you're willing to go bankrupt and sanctioned, which is kind of what North Korea has done in a way, that's also a route you don't want to go down on. But you know what is economical, and you know what is in the grasp of almost every nation out there? It's cyber warfare. See, it's a lot cheaper to buy computer equipment, connection, connecting yourself to the internet, and training a few engineers. And it's also beneficial when North Korea has a big ally, <coughs> China, in this case, where some of your agents can go and train. And then you can also train back home as well. It's not hard to train cyber warfare engineers. I mean, really, it's it's a lot more cheap than, again, building WMDs or that conventional warfare route I mentioned earlier. See, what we've learned from Colonial Pipeline is that you can do a lot of damage to a country, a nation, by interrupting the most basic of supply lines and fucking up the most basic of power grids then you would ever attempt to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a conventional way. See, North Korea can't go up against the United States, but North Korea can hack key segments of the United States and really, really cause some grief. See, if you add ransomware into the mix, which is now a lucrative business, basically, we're about to find out, Lazarus Group is basically the cutting edge of this kind of cyber warfare. Now, you might have heard of Lazarus Group in other names. Some of them would be Apt 38, God's Apostles, God's Disciples, the Guardians of Peace. I know, it's kind of cringy. Zinc, Who is Team and Hidden Cobra. I mean, it kind of sounds like various fucking prison gangs, but it is what it is. Now, around 2009 was when these guys first showed up. They went far enough to be labeled an advanced persistent threat, which is typically a term that you're going to associate with nation state hackers. So people that have the backing of an actual nation. See, if you want to look at hackers in a very rough way, you've got the individual, you've got hacking gangs and cartels, but the most scariest of them are actual nation states. Because not only are these people very intelligent at the hacks that they perform, but they have the backing of entire nations, meaning that at any moment they can just hide behind the nation state and never really be in well they can be indicted but most of the times these people live in relative freedom and they constantly keep attacking each other until 10 years down the road from this video when actual sanctions and proper methods are put to prevent cyber attacking this is going to keep going on in fact if you look at the map right here that i have playing to the right it's not something that i have as a nice visualizer this is something from kaspersky labs where basically they're showing a real-time assessment of all the cyber attacks that are going in the world right now and while this is based on general data sources you can actually understand that between right now there are multiple attacks going on centered around the United States to Russia to China in fact if I'm not mistaken Russia right now is the most cyber attacked country at this point in time this is a war that's waging on while we're sleeping and playing our video games it is some serious fucking business now earlier on they actually had a 2021 indictment that was actually ended up releasing so three north korean military hackers indicted in wide ranging scheme to commit cyber attacks and financial crimes across the globe so these indictments actually came from the WannaCry ransomware and then recent money schemes where they were siphoning cryptocurrency for banks and were operating in north korea and china so the federal indictment unsealed today's charges three north korean computer programmers with participating in a wide-ranging criminal conspiracy to conduct a series of destructive cyber attacks to steal and extort more than 1.3 billion dollars worth of money and cryptocurrency from financial institutions and companies no small feat 
Now, here are the schemes that the U.S. government is alleging. So some of them were cyber attacks on the entertainment industry, when Sony Pictures ended up being attacked because of the movie that they were making called The Interview, which depicted Kim Jong-un in a very negative light. But we'll get to a lot of these in a bit. They also had cyber-enabled heists from banks, numerously operating in Vietnam, Bangladesh, Taiwan, Mexico, Malta, and Africa by hacking the swift message system that banks use to transfer money across country to country. Then they had ATM cash out thefts, targeting of cryptocurrencies, typically in South Korea, sphere phishing campaigns, which basically they sent a bunch of targeted employees emails that could compromise, and some of the targets in this case included defense contractors, energy companies, aerospace companies, technology companies, the U.S. Department of State, and the Department of Defense. If you fuck with this last one right here, think of your life as effectively forfeit if they ever catch you. Now again, the people that they ended up getting in this case were money laundering that were even located into a city close to where I live in Mississauga, Ontario. Now, in this case, the hacking indictment filed in the U.S. District Court in Los Angeles alleges that John Shang Hyok, Kim Il, and Park Jin Hyok were members of a unit of Reconnaissance General Bureau, RGB, a military intelligence agency of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, were engaged in criminal hacking. These North Korean military hacking units are known by multiple names in the cybersecurity community including Lazarus Group and Apt38. So the num names I mentioned earlier. So yeah, this is serious, serious business. In 2021 alone, this is an unsealed criminal complaint, which is serious. I mean, being indicted in something like this, like I said before, your life is effectively forfeit. Now, to go back to the initial humble beginnings of such a group, we have to look at something called Operation Troy back in 2009. Now, earlier on, some of the first forms of attacks were DDoS campaigns. For those of you who don't know, DDoS are denial of service attacks. I want you to think of it like this. Every time you have your favorite streamer online and somebody gets their IP address, there is some person committing a federal crime by booting them off of their stream. Basically, the general idea is sending enough traffic to that person's router or their server and basically getting them knocked off. I've had the same thing happen to me with my IP being leaked once, static by the way, through GTA Online. Somebody got my IP and they started booting me off the internet uh, because they just had my IP. So I was booted off and I really couldn't avoid it unless I changed my internet service provider or I got myself a new modem. DDoSing is basically the same thing that they're doing here except at a much larger scale. So Lazarus Group employed the use of a pretty large botnet. So basically, a large group of computers were infected and taking commands from one central server. So I want you to imagine if you had a million computers infected, you could basically have a few servers send commands to each of those million systems. Now imagine if you had a million systems pinging one specific server. That's a lot of traffic, and that'll probably shut down anything large enough. Now, of course, in recent times, we have plenty of mitigations, but this is back in 2009, okay? They could have done some serious damage, and they did. Now, instead of a million computers in my example, the actual number was somewhere close to around 20,000 and somewhere up to like 180,000, 170,000. And the way that this was assessed was basically at some point, researchers got the logs of the command servers the hackers had used. Around 40 websites were targeted in this actual attack. And the attack happened in the course of three waves. The first one was on the 4th of July, Independence Day where the White House website was attacked, the Pentagon, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, Amazon, and the Washington Post newspaper. The next wave came just three days later, targeting South Korea, once again targeting their government websites like the National Intelligence Service, their intelligence agency, and the Blue House. So later on, security researchers thought and found out that European countries ended up assisting in some unwitting way by deploying W30T Dozer. Now, security researchers later had found out that European countries were somehow involved in assisting this attack by, in some capacity, deploying W32 Dozer, which was the malware that was used in the attack. For those of you who don't know what this is, W32 Dozer was a computer worm that came from the MyDoom family of worms, pretty popular back in the day. Now, to explain what happened over here, to create a botnet used to DDoS these websites and servers, the worm was spread via email attachment. 
Now, throughout a lot of virus investigations that I've done, I've looked at plenty of malware that effectively spreads through email services. And you would be surprised how many people actually still fall for this. It's effective because it uses social engineering and the gullibility of the average user to spread it. See, if you get a work email, all right, that doesn't look too fishy and you don't look too into it because you're working and you're probably already burned out, sometimes they come with work attachments, work disguised attachments. You open it up and lo and behold, you have been infected. Now, this worm in this, in this instance consorts with a command server and at the same time, it can also use your email client and your contact directory and spread the malware to all the addresses you have saved yourself. See, this is how you go quickly from having zero systems infected to in a very short amount of time going to 50,000 infected systems and then 100,000 infected systems. That's how these worms work and that's why they are so effective if left unchecked. Now, to understand the importance of it is when government sites are attacked like this, you need to identify a breach and then further identify if anything gets stolen. And in this case, thankfully nothing had happened. See, what was interesting in the W32 Dozer Worm, it was designed to wipe the master boot record and ultimately make it so that the computers couldn't boot. Now, think of it like the CIH malware we once covered on virus investigations. Now, instead of wiping motherboards, which I guess at the time of this, this malware attack wouldn't even have worked, what they would do in this case was after they had done everything, they would make you go through that very hellish task of reinstalling Windows. I mean, these bastards were playing serious games. So then two days later, on the third and final wave, websites in South Korea and its various banks were targeted, and the U.S. State Department confirmed that even their site was going through attacks at the time. Not a high enough volume, but enough to actually just keep an eye on it, right? And at this point, federal operators started to mitigate the final wave of these attacks. So listen, at the end of the day, it even turned out that the majority of the code that was reused in this malware attack was from my doom years ago, before Operation Troy. I want you to think of this as sort of a start starting point for what Lazarus would become much more later on, okay? No one at the time knew that this attack was North Korean in origin, until South Korean cops analyzed the infected computers in that botnet and uncovered evidence of pro-North Korean elements, I guess is what they said at the time. See, South Korean intelligence services tracked the IP address that was linked to the North Korean Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. Again, a lot of this is alleged, but this is one of those attacks that because of the size of the botnet, it's also a bit hard to pin down. Uh, there's so many origin points that people can say it's North Korea, China, or even as far as the European Union. Now, four years later in 2013, South Korea faced a series of cyber attacks that will forever be dubbed as the 10 Days of Rain. So basically this involved with an incident regarding South Korean television stations starting to notice frozen terminals around their around their you know bases. And financial institutions, like in this case, Shinhan Bank reported actually having mobile payments fucked with and ATM systems in the country screwed around with. See, this happened during slightly higher elevated tensions between both the Koreas, because at this point, Pyongyang was actually testing nuclear, you know, weapons at the time. Now, South Korean intelligence noticed that the attacking IPs in this case were Chinese origin. Now, to understand, this doesn't mean that an attack is necessarily Chinese-oriented, okay? See, anybody can route internet traffic through any source. Imagine a VPN, right? You probably use one right now. Some of you might be using one to watch this video, or you might be browsing the Sea of Pirates with a VPN. I'm just saying, I'm not judging, I'm just putting it out there, okay? One of y'all is probably doing it law of numbers wise. So just because you say in this case that you set your VPN to like Australia, for instance, you are not actually in Australia, but see to the person that's being hacked or being communicated by your system, all they can see is, hey, there's somebody from the land down under talking to me, which is effectively what we had over here. So Chinese IPs aren't a dead giveaway, but why it becomes a big focus is that usually North Koreans to hide their attacks will typically go behind Chinese IPs. See, once you have a Chinese IP involved into it, going beyond that usually is a very difficult thing to do. And that's how North Koreans mask their cyber attacks. One of their biggest and only allies is China. And there's no doubt in my mind that China is complicit in some capacity with North Korean cyber attacks. Again, that's my opinion. Now, the attack led to damaging six organizations pretty heavily. And instead of what people thought were just DDoS attacks and hard drive overwrites, it was later actually discovered that 32,000 computers and servers of financial and media organizations typically were damaged. 
So we're talking Shinan Bank, Jiju Bank, Nong Hyup, I hope I'm pronouncing a lot of that right, reporting network paralysis and fucking outages. Media services like Korean Broadcasting System and YTN were also hit with system shutdowns. Listen, like as far as motives go during tensions like this, the attack seemed to constantly point, circumstantially at least, to the north. And if causing damage was the concern, then they actually got it. Because we're talking about somewhere to the tune of $750 million in damages total. Now turn that back to the Chinese IP, and it's probably most likely that North Korean agents were probably involved into this. But we'll actually get to the whole proof section in a little bit. See, a month later in June, another attack involved a information leak where a hacker actually admitted to leaking hundreds of thousands of soldier information, signery party members, and operators in the U.S. Force Korea section, okay? 35,000 operators in that joint task command. Now, on the morning of the 25th in July of that year, the Xiong Wade website and various web pages of the government were actually defaced, okay? So basically, this is when a hacker will often change a web page through malware, various injections, or just gaining it to a compromised web server where the page is even hosted. So they started including phrases like, All hail the unified chairman, Kim Jong-un, until our demands are met, our attacks will continue, greet us, we are anonymous. They weren't anonymous. I mean, not, not, not with those declarations. We all know where these attacks were coming from. God damn. Later, South Korean intelligence agencies, they found out that one specific IP was matched to a previous hacking attempt that originated from, guess what, Pyongyang. And it was, if that wasn't enough, the pattern of hacking actually resembled the prior North Korean cyber attacks that occurred. Now, this is going to be a real thing, all right? And we'll get to it later. The actual resemblance of all of these attacks. This is how we're able to identify that North Korea is typically behind a lot of it. Now, compared to the last incident where we had simple DDoS attacks, this one was obviously a bit more severe and expensive. So at this point, North Korea has basically proven that they're the new up and coming player in the cyber warfare community. And an actual task force internationally had started to form just to counter these people. Now, at this point, we're not referring to these guys as Lazarus. Lazarus is the name you'll see later on in their career. At this time, the persona they were using was Who Is Team? Of course, these names constantly change, but, you know, because these are cyber terrorist groups, okay? They constantly have to shift their names around, right? The more notoriety they get, the harder it is to kind of, you know, deny their involvement and to hide them when it comes to more lucrative attacks. Again, when we go down further into this rabbit hole, these attacks only become more and more severe. Now, in 2014 was the infamous Sony Pictures attack. Now, this attack put Lazarus basically on the map. Back in 2014, Sony Pictures announced a movie called The Interview. Now, it's a comedy movie about an assassination plot regarding Kim Jong-un. Now, the movie wasn't really anything special. It's just a James Franco, Seth Rogen comedy movie. So, I mean, you got to expect a lot of dick jokes and bong rips. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's funny as fuck when an edible kicks in. But the movie wasn't just about comedy. I mean, they were actually pretty critical of North Korea, specifically in terms of how the Kim dynasty lives lavishly while the country starves. I mean, seriously, look at the amount of Hennessy they import into that country. The elite live good. Good. Now, during the time, Lazarus kept calling themselves the Guardians of Peace, okay, during this hack, which is a real cringe name. And in this hack, they leaked the confidential information of employees in Sony Pictures Division, plans for their upcoming movies, and even some copies of unreleased things as well. Now, the way that Sony Pictures' hack worked in this case was through a malware variant, which would, known, which would be known as Shimoon, okay? So this is also known as W32 Dist Track. Dist Track, okay? It's not that meme -y. Basically, it was an attack that targeted the 32-bit NT Windows kernel, where it basically infects the system, catalogs the important files, uploads them back to the attacking server, and then erases the files, and then once all that is done, it then corrupts the boot record of the system, which, as you can guess, renders it unbootable. So again, the same malware was actually used to attack Saudi Aramco, which at the time of this of this attack was the biggest company on the planet i think apple was just about to beat them in market valuation but saudi aramco that would act, at the time that was the largest cyber attack in history 
Again, it would be a hot minute before like solar winds became the topic of discussion. But yeah, back then, uh, this malware strain was used in other various attacks. So basically, the attackers didn't want that movie to be released. And at the time, they even had like terror attacks that were th they were threatening actual theaters. And at this point, the FBI started to get involved because, I mean, at this point, when you have like real world attack threats, they don't fuck around. The U.S. government will make sure that doesn't happen. Now, the Guardians of Peace sent two threats, okay? One to the Sony executives telling them, listen, as long as you don't release this movie, they don't have to attack any further. And then they uploaded something to a code sharing site called Pastebin, where they, where, where they posted, and I quote, you have suffered through enough threats. We lift the ban. The interview may release now. Again, on the stipulation that Kim Jong-un's death scene wasn't too happy. You know, they had Katy Perry, I think, playing in the background of that scene and the actor for Kim Jong-un. Yeah, he fucking incinerated on camera, by the way. They tripled down. God bless on that one. Good shit. Now, even President Obama at the time criticized Sony Pictures for basically being intimidated by the North Koreans. I mean, honestly, that, that's kind of a dickish thing to say, because what do you do as a company when you've been this cyber fucked? by another country and at this point like it's easy for president obama to go out and say listen you know don't be scared bro you just got you got fit you got goat seed all right at this point it's reasonable to be scared so an interesting point to understand is the interview did pretty well financially because of the streisand effect that was caused by the north korean hackers basically putting a big spotlight on the movie itself i mean at this point people wanted to watch the movie not because of the fact that it was about kim jong-un but because north korean hackers got so ass mad that they decided to do all this bullshit now, later on, they did a technical analysis of the malware that was used, and they found out that it was linked to previous known North Korean developed malware that the FBI had found prior. Now, the FBI also found overlap in the infrastructure that they were using for the attack. They found several IP addresses that were linked to North Korean systems that were actually hard-coded into that used malware. The IPs were linked to North Korean businesses operating in Shenyang, Northeast China. See, the malware and toolkit used in this attack also had a stark amount of similarities to the 2013 cyber attacks in South Korea. Again, you'll see that a lot of ways that Lazarus gets linked is that they have a certain MO. And once you're able to identify that MO constantly, it's very easy to identify that this is the same cyber group doing the same cyber shenanigans in the same parts of the world. Now, some of the IP addresses that were found were because of really shoddy VPN and proxy usage. I mean, the FBI found out that they were literally originating in North Korea. The Guardians of Peace themselves weren't exactly the smartest tools in the shed. Now, to understand, this is pretty damning because North Korea has really tightly controlled access. It's not like us on our side of the world where everyone can access the greater internet. In North Korea, only the elite and government approved can access the outer internet because for North Koreans, they have their own intranet, their own internal internet, all right, that they only access, which again is also highly monitored. Now, at the same time, in this case, even the NSA at the time helped corroborate this attack because they even found similarities in, the int in their own intrusion into North Korea themselves. So again, not exa these MOs are dead giveaways that Lazarus is behind it. Now, North Korea's state-sponsored news agency also denied that the government was ever involved. But here's the funniest thing about it, okay? They did say while they weren't involved that the hacking into Sony Pictures might be a righteous deed of the supporters and sympathizers with the DPRK in response to its appeal. Yeah, it wasn't us, but it must have been those heroic hackers that are fighting for the honor of the North Korean government. God damn. It's like, listen, I get you want to deny it. Everyone wants to deny a cyber attack. But these guys have to self-fallatiate just a little bit in front of the world. It's hilarious. Now, anyways, this actually ended up becoming so political that it actually even heightened sanctions against North Korea by executive order from Barack Obama because of how high profile the hack was. 
Now, guys and gals, if you thought the Sony hack was big enough, if you thought that was them peaking, mm -mm, we got bank guys, I shit you not. In February 2016, you had 35 transactions that were sent from accounts uh, that were held by the Central Bank of Bangladesh uh, to the Federal Reserve of the United States, okay? Federal Reserve in the New in New York. So they basically used the SWIFT system and they siphoned, they attempted 35 transactions. In reality, only five of these went through, which succeeded in basically transferring about 100 Hundred million dollars, twenty million which were sent to Sri Lanka, and eighty-one million that was went that went to the Philippines. Now, in good news, the twenty million that was sent to Sri Lanka was actually recovered, but sixty-three million was ultimately siphoned away. Okay, I think it was like fifty-eight million that was siphoned away, but effectively there was money in the Philippines that was effectively gone. All right, it was actually such a massive hack that it almost caused the Philippines to be reinstated in the Financial Action Task Force for Money Laundering. Okay, they were about to be blacklisted once again. Now, this is from CISA, which is Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. The joint advisory is a result of analytics effort among the Cybersecurity Division, okay, and the FBI and U.S. Cybercom, all right? So basically, they started to look at Beagle Boys, right? An element of the North Korean government's RGB, okay, have likely been active since at least 2014. As opposed to typical cybercrime, the group likely conducts well-planned, disciplined, and methodical cyber operations more akin to careful espionage activities. So they're pretty serious. They've netted hundreds of millions of US dollars and are likely a major source of funding for the North Korean regime. They have value, all right? They have some real value. Now they've been identified as Apt38 by FireEye, Blue Enteroff by Kaspersky, and Lazarus Group by EST Security. And then as also as Stardust Coloma. Now, it's also known that these are just names of various factions that Lazarus runs. But here they've got targeted nations. So anything below the uh, equator is basically free game by these individuals. So Africa, chunks of India, chunks of Southeast Asia, and then you've got South America basically taken. They've got an anatomy of how their cyber attacks work, okay? So basically they send a sphere phishing attack to the victim institution, right? Where they basically try to go to the payment switch application server and then the SWIFT terminal. They then use this to attack the SWIFT network and make pretty much fraudulent transactions. At the same time, they use the actual credentials to go to the payments network, they attack ATMs, attack cards, and effectively, at the end of the day, the attacker reaches at the end and siphons cash and sends it back to the good old North Korean boys back home. Now, for those who don't know what SWIFT is, it's the banking protocol for cross-nation transit. It's known as Society of Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. It's basically a fancy messaging network network used by banks to send money transfers instructions rapidly and securely. If you basically transferred any money across countries in a wire transfer, you probably at some point asked for the SWIFT code for the bank that you're sending money to. Without that SWIFT code, sending money over borders isn't exactly as easy, okay? Most banks require it. So Bangladesh Central Bank was targeted because it had a higher amount of weaknesses to exploit. The weaknesses were basically human beings that you could exploit via social engineering. Now, in fact, it's believed that few of the people working at the bank were actually complicit in the attack itself. Now, see, what happened here was the attackers in this case were trying to siphon out almost $1 billion in Bangladesh's bank account with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And during the time when the bank was actually closed, hackers compromised the network and started to use the SWIFT terminal to send requests with compromised credentials. These credentials, as you can imagine, were obtained using, guess what, email attacks. So basically, they used a malware known as Drydex, which is something that typically uses macros in Microsoft Word. I made an interesting video regarding COVID-19 malware that came out where they were effectively using these documents and macros hidden within to attack users and steal their credentials and data. Again, you'd be surprised at how effective these email attacks really are. Now, the 20 million that went to Sri Lanka was supposed to go to the Shalika Foundation. However, because the attacker misspelled foundations, I shit you not, they caused a douche bank at the time to halt the routed cash and make sure that the Bangladesh bank, that this was actually a normal authorized transaction. So yes, one misspelling on the word foundation, I think they called it foundation, caused them to miss out $20 million in a payday. I mean, they're not, re I mean, that has got to be the biggest slap in the face at that point. And that dude must have gotten a fucking beating back home in North Korea for that fuck up. 
Now, the money that did go to the Philippines in this case was then sent to five accounts in the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation. The funds were then converted into Philippine pesos and then consolidated into one central account. Eventually, that money was transferred and before the Bangladesh Bank could end up sending out a swift message to the RCBC Banking Group, a withdrawal of $58 million had already happened. Now, that's a lot to take in. So while these two banks are fighting it out in court and fines are being levied out, the FBI put North Korea into their crosshairs. See, U.S. prosecutors started suspecting that the heist originated in the government of North Korea, and even some Chinese nationals ended up facilitating, allegedly, some of the withdrawn funds in the Philippines. Now, security firms at this point actually reference Lazarus by name as being the most probable perpetrators of the heist. See, how they figured it out was, again, through the similarities in the various hackings that they had once done. And at this point, Lazarus has a lot of examples to look back at. To understand, first, it was DDoSing, then shutting down infrastructure, then attacking a major film studio, and now... If this is tied to the North Korean government, they would be the first nation to participate in a bank robbery over the internet. And again, if this is proven, that would mean North Korea, again, it's the first country to fucking rob a bank. So now we move on to 2017, which is the WannaCry attack. Now, this is something we're a bit familiar with on this channel. I've covered this whole thing in its own virus investigations. If you want to know more about that, go check that video out. But the gist of this was that over a period of four days, a ransomware malware was sent to Windows systems using a leaked NSA exploit known as Eternal Blue to hijack systems and charge fees ranging in the hundreds of dollars. Now, it's again believed Lazarus was behind it because the attack originated at Pyongyang and it had similar symptomology to the previous hacks. Now, in the end, the United States indicted Park Jin Hyok, if you remember that name from before, it's the name we saw earlier in the indictment, uh, because they alleged he was working as an expert in the North Korean Reconnaissance General Bureau, the RGB. I think a lot of blame in this case, though, could also be placed on the NSA for knowingly not basically disclosing this exploit, Eternal Blue at the time. Had they have done it, I think, a lot of the stuff could have been mitigated. But then again, the NSA does what the NSA does, all right? There's really nothing you can say against them, all right? I mean, Sam Fisher works for the fucking NSA, okay? I don't fuck with Sam Fisher, therefore I don't fuck with the NSA. Now, in 2017 to 2019, cryptocurrency and bank thefts were occurring routinely. At this point, money becomes the real focus of Lazarus because in 2018, it's reported that Lazarus was attacking users in South Korea, mostly college students, who were delving into the Bitcoin and Monero world, two popular cryptocurrencies. Now, as you can imagine, what ties this back to Lazarus is, again, the similarity in the attacks. You might be wondering, Muto, why don't they just change their modus operandi? You could ask that to a million people, honestly. I mean, it's just their style. And if it works, it works. Fuck if it's noticeable. I mean, if you have the backing of an entire nation, why would you even decide to change? Now, by abusing flaws in the popular office software, Hangul, they actually use sphere phishing attacks, so email attacks, specifically targeting students. They stole their credentials and siphoned money through crypto. And they actually learned something really cool. Cryptocurrency is a nice way to launder money. Hell, it turns out it's a great way to get around the sanctions that North Korea is being put under. So over the course of the year, they started sealing millions from various exchanges. You might have even heard of NiceHash, a cloud you know, mining company. They had 4,000 Bitcoins, over 4,000 stolen from them. And actually, it was later even confirmed Lazarus was linked to a bunch of these thefts. Now imagine at this point they've discovered the value of cryptocurrency, the scale of how much they're robbing at this point is enough to put some exchanges into fucking bankruptcy. Even in 2019, they started to emerge in the eyes of the US government when they put a red alert out with something called the electric fish malware. So to understand what the electric fish malware is, we're going to read another CISA group, okay? So to understand, this malware attempts to establish TCP sessions with the source IP address and the destination IP address. If a connection is made to both the source and destination, the malicious utility will implement a custom protocol, which will allow traffic to rapidly and efficiently be tunneled between two machines. If necessary, the malware can authenticate with the proxy to be able to reach the destination IP address. After the malware authenticates with the proxy, it will immediately attempt to establish a session located outside of the target's network and the source IP address. So basically, Electric Fish is trying to connect to certain devices and maintain a tunnel of data between them. Long story short, this malware was used for high profile robberies regarding financial institutions and ATMs throughout the course of 2019. 
Now, in 2020, the pharmaceutical attack started to happen. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemics and lockdowns last year, Lazarus was operating, effectively targeting the pharmaceutical companies around that were developing the vaccine for COVID-19 at the time. Now, once again, they used tried and true sphere phishing email attacks, except they tried to be health workers. They sent malicious files, links, emails to actual employees at all of these organizations. Now, why would Lazarus attack Big Pharma, right? For one, if they obtained vaccine information, which at the time would have been very very lucrative if they could sell it to the right bidder. So yeah, that's basically the story of how a group that started over a decade ago has now become a superpower in nation state hacking, cyber warfare around the world. Now imagine starting off as a group of people running DDoS attacks on government sites, initially basically being laughed at, to siphoning millions of dollars in cryptocurrencies and causing billions in damages. Look, their methods aren't exactly the most interesting, I'll admit. But the reason they work so well is that people constantly fall for them. Look, mo if most, if not all of their attacks involved compromising emails and using human social engineering, and even then with such a rote toolkit, they're able to do so goddamn much. And that's most likely has to do with the fact that it appears to again have nation state backing. Groups like Lazarus don't actually come too often. With a rap sheet like theirs, they've earned the highest place at the crypto at the, at the at the cyber warfare you know table. Now, while they've made a name for themselves, it's really only a matter of time before they actually get caught slipping real hard. And there's no doubt in my mind, when given the chance, any international law enforcement group will seek their capture. And this time. The, uh, the time these people will do in prison is fucking astronomical. It's only a matter of time before these guys get really greedy and start attacking co countries like China or Russia, which are typically North Korean allies. And at some point, Big Brother is going to have to come down, slap you in the head, and tell you to hand over some of these fucks. Now, the point of this video isn't to glorify Lazarus, okay? They really don't deserve glory. In all reality, they're not the greatest hackers in the world. They just have a big rap sheet. Really, it's to advise you individuals that groups like this exist, and they become the new face of international warfare on a battlefield where all of us are in the crosshairs. You, me, and every big corporation that funnels mass data, sometimes our data, is now under attack. And it's why we need to be so careful with what we do with our data. Because listen, we can trust the companies that we operate with, okay? In some capacity, you probably watch this video and trust Google. You probably trust Microsoft. Although it takes one vulnerability, one fuck up in those companies to allow these assholes to run off with your information that can be used to identify you, to profile you, and potentially end up cheating you. That said though, ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and I'm signing off. Today we learned about the Lazarus North Korean cyber attack group that basically made international headlines and still do to this day. Will they ever be stopped? That's a story I'm looking forward to. And when that happens, boy oh boy, am I gonna be the first person to be smiling and talking about it and shooting off fireworks. This is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.